Now that we know what tensors are in general, let's dig into particular types of them, starting with scalar tensors. In this video, I'll cover the particular theory around them, including their appropriate notation, and then we'll have our first hands-on code demo, wherein we create scalars in three of the most widely used Python libraries for working with tensors, NumPy, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. Scalars are characterized by having no dimensions. So they are a single numeric value. And they are typically denoted in lowercase and with italics, for example, as a lowercase x like this. And across whatever programming language we're using, whatever programming library we're using, these ultimately are typed. So sometimes explicitly, sometimes not explicitly, um, but like all other tensors in any machine learning library that we use, any numeric library that we use, the scalars will be typed. So for example, they could be an integer or they could be a 32-bit float. To get a sense of this hands-on, let's do our first hands-on code demo, which is in this Intro to Linear Algebra Jupyter Notebook. To make your way there, you can go to github.com slash johncrone slash mlfoundations. And in here, we have all of the Jupyter Notebooks associated with the Machine Learning Foundation series. So there are eight subjects in the series. We're in this first one right now, the Intro to Linear Algebra series. So you can click on this link here to open up the Intro to Linear Algebra Jupyter Notebook that we're interested in, or you can make your way into the notebooks directory, click on Intro to Linear Algebra, and my recommended way for following along with the exercises, you can just statically look in here. So the kind of first demo that we're doing is in here, but my recommended way of following along is in Colab, and then you can execute the code interactively. When we're in Colab, the first thing that we wanna do is go up to the edit option in the menu bar and then clear all outputs. So this will um, prevent us from having all of the executed code. So I already went through and executed all of the code so that when you look at the static notebook, say in GitHub, you have all the code executed there. But when we're executing interactively, like we are now, we don't wanna see that. And so the clear all outputs will allow us to regenerate everything fresh. So it feels nice and clean as we output cells. So Jupyter Notebooks contain a mix of markdown and actual code. So I have all these markdown cells here, which you can edit um, and that describe what's happening in the Jupyter Notebook. And those are alongside actual code cells. You can execute a code cell by uh, pressing Shift Enter, or you can just press play and it will execute it. You can ignore this warning, you can trust me. And so here, in just a very quick example, we used base Python to create a rank zero tensor. And so I assigned the value 25, a magnitude of 25, to that rank zero scalar tensor X. And then we can look at the type. It is an integer. And if you'd like more specificity than that, if you'd actually like to say, I want a 62-bit integer or an unsigned 8-bit integer, then you would need to use NumPy or another numeric library, which we will talk about momentarily. Now, so if we have a second scalar tensor three, we can then use the usual Python base library plus sign to create a pi sum object, another scalar tensor, that is the sum of 25 and three. And what's the type of that? Well, it's also an integer. Now, if we create a float value by specifying a decimal, now when we add y to it, which was an integer, we get a float out and we can confirm the type of that. It is in fact a float. So um, if we interact the integer and the float objects together, for example, by adding them together, they will default to the float type. In PyTorch, which is a Python library for 
doing something called automatic differentiation. We'll talk about that a lot later on in the Machine Learning Foundation series. So right now we're just in the first topic, which is intro to linear algebra. But when we get, when we get into calculus, we'll start talking a lot about automatic differentiation libraries. The two most popular automatic differentiation libraries are PyTorch and TensorFlow. And so let's cover them in turn. PyTorch tensors are designed to be Pythonic, that is to feel and behave just like NumPy arrays. And the advantage of PyTorch tensors relative to NumPy arrays is that they can easily be used for operations on GPUs. So GPUs, graphics processing units, these allow us to have many parallel matrix operations. They were designed for rendering graphics in video games or doing video processing, that kind of thing. But they are also used widely in training deep learning algorithms. And so the PyTorch library makes it easy to work with NumPy arrays in that way. It also, as I mentioned, allows us to perform that kind of differentiation that we'll get into that is so important to machine learning and we'll see lots of in the calculus subjects later on. Documentation on PyTorch tensors, including all of the available types, is available through this link here, which provides all the information on PyTorch tensors, including all the types, as you can see here. So we'll import the PyTorch library, which comes by default installed in Colab. And I won't specify the type here. You can optionally do it. So you could set, say, this argument. You could set this additional argument here, and then you'd be specifying that you want a 16-bit float. But we didn't do that here. So we have our integer tensor, and we can look at its shape, and we see that it has no dimensions. So as I promised you, scalars have no dimension, no dimensionality whatsoever. All right, let's look at doing the same kind of thing in TensorFlow, which is almost as easy as it is in PyTorch. So tensors in TensorFlow are created with a wrapper, and you can read about them all through this link. The most common types are variable, constant, placeholder, and sparse tensor. And by far the most popular of all those is the variable method, which is what we'll use here. So as with TensorFlow tensors in PyTorch, we can similarly perform operations and we can easily convert to and from NumPy arrays. We can also perform the differentiation that we'll need later on for training our algorithms and which we'll learn about a lot in calculus. So just like in PyTorch, you can have a look at the full list of data types here. And just as a quick side note, I have begun to become a bigger fan of PyTorch than TensorFlow. So both libraries have all of the methods that you need for training machine learning models, for performing automatic differentiation, for training on GPUs. But PyTorch is just a lot more fun to use. It behaves as you would expect um, as a Python user. The stack traces are much easier to follow than in TensorFlow. You'll see even for doing simple things like creating a tensor, we have to use these wrappers in TensorFlow and then performing operations. These simple ones that we do here are quite easy, but once we get into slightly more complex TensorFlow, it becomes a bit of a chore with extra steps relative to PyTorch. The advantage of TensorFlow is that there's a much larger community. So it's an older library than PyTorch, so you'll see it in a lot more production systems. It also has for production at time of recording. For production applications, there are a lot more libraries for using lots of servers, for training your models, for um, serving your models to clients either in their web browser or in um, low power devices, phones, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of extra libraries associated with TensorFlow, but it is a bit less fun to play around with. And so you'll notice later on in this machine learning foundation series, I'll tend towards using PyTorch where I could use either PyTorch or TensorFlow for various things. So let's import the TensorFlow library. That's easy to do. And then let's create a TensorFlow variable called XTF. Here I am specifying the type 
though that's optional to do. And so you'll see it's a 62-bit integer. And even the printouts from TensorFlow are a bit uglier than they would be with PyTorch. Remember, we just had this nice clean printout here in PyTorch in TensorFlow just to see that this is the number 25. We have to look in here. And part of this is related to the TensorFlow Python library being built from C++. And so it was ported over to Python. And so we have this kind of hangover, these kinds of nested things that are a little bit clunkier. All right, but we can look at the shape. Okay, again, just like our scalar tensor in PyTorch, the tensor has no shape. There's no dimensionality. We'll see examples later where there is dimensionality. And so it'll be clear what these square brackets mean later. Let's create a second variable, ytf. It's also an integer, it has the value three. We can add those together. And you can also use, in either case here, you're using actually the same method, whether you use the TensorFlow add method explicitly here, or just the plus symbol. It's the plus symbol has been overloaded in Python when we use TensorFlow uh, tensors with it. And so we are actually performing the same method as right here. It's just a little simpler to see here. So either way, we of course end up with a scalar value of 28. It is also a 16-bit integer, just like its um, incoming tensors. The outbound tensor is the same. And we can uh, convert them easily into NumPy, scalars, NumPy tensors, uh, or NumPy arrays is probably the, the most canonical way to describe um, NumPy uh, matrices or, or scalar values. And so we can convert it using this NumPy method here. And then we can confirm that the type is okay. It's a 16-bit uh, NumPy array now. As a final operation here, I will create a 16-bit float instead of an integer. So just as at the top of this section here, when I created a TensorFlow scalar tensor with a value of 25 and I specified an integer that came out as an integer 25. Now, it, when I do it as a float value, so I, I specify 16-bit float, it comes out as a decimal value, as a float value, but still it has no shape. All right, so that's how you create scalars in base Python in TensorFlow and in PyTorch. In the next section, we will cover how to create vectors and as well as how to do some simple operations on vectors in NumPy, PyTorch, and TensorFlow. So that is coming up next.